How shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Jesus prayed to the Father, sanctify them in truth. Thy word is truth. For the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. We'll have a few moments of silent prayer so they can, uh, sound engineers can crank the volume up just a little bit. And uh, for us to make sure that we are in fellowship, there we go. Make sure we're in fellowship. Give us a few opportunity, a few minutes to uh, uh, admit or acknowledge our sins to God the Father to make sure that we are ready to focus, concentrate, study the Word of God this evening under the teaching ministry of God the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Our Father, we do thank you for this privilege and opportunity to have this time to get away from the details of our lives and to focus on your word, that it is your word that gives us absolute truth, provides knowledge so that we can have objectivity to evaluate our own lives and the events around us, and it is your word that the Holy Spirit uses to mature us in the spiritual life. Now, Father, as we study these things and begin the the study of Hebrews this evening, we pray that you would challenge us, that the Holy Spirit would take these things and and drive them home in each of our lives in terms of our own personal application, and that we would have the spiritual uh, courage to take these things and apply them to our own lives. We pray this in Christ's name, amen. Hebrews, it's a book that many people love to study. It's also a book that many people don't understand. It's one of the most uh, difficult books in the New Testament to interpret. One of the reasons is because it is so heavily based on Old Testament theology. If you do not have an adequate understanding of Old Testament theology, then it becomes very difficult to interpret the book of Hebrews because it was written to an audience that obviously was well versed in Old Testament ritual, understood the Levitical offerings, Levitical priesthood, the operations of the tabernacle, and they understood the doctrinal import of those things from an Old Testament vantage point. And so the writer, in an extremely skillful and logical way, builds an intricate web of arguments to support the doctrines of the deity and the humanity of Christ, which in turn lead to the doctrine of his high priesthood, his unique Melchizedekian priesthood. And of course, as soon as you mention Melchizedek, there's always a few people who come out of the woodwork with their various odd views and ideas and theories as to who Melchizedek was. And so we'll have to travel down that road a little bit. And then you come to those final concluding chapters that focus so heavily on Jesus Christ, keeping the author and perfecter of our faith uh, before our eyes. So this is a book that will thrill us. It's a book that, that uh, will challenge us in many ways because of its intricate logic, just to understand the thought flow of the author. And this, of course, challenges many people to read. I can't tell you how many times I'll have people come up to me and ask a question about some passage in Hebrews, and you just look at them and wonder, do you really know how to read? I'd hate to look at your income tax. I hope you use an accountant, because if you apply these principles of hermeneutics to the instructions on your uh, income tax each year, you're going to jail for a long time. So we have to take time to look at context. That is so important, context, context, context. It's almost as important as location in real estate. So we have to understand the context, not only of Hebrews, But we also have to understand the context of these Old Testament citations that we're going to find. And one of the challenging things about Hebrews is it's basically an enigma. This is something that 
challenges so many people, one thing that interests people, and they, some folks just love a puzzle, and they love a mystery, and they love to solve these things, and they'll go to any lengths to come up with some new innovative solution to various enigmas in Hebrews. And one of the reasons that you have so many enigmas in Hebrews is because it's a, it's a book in the Bible that isn't really an epistle. We don't know who wrote it. We don't know to whom he wrote. We don't know the reason or the occasion for his writing. We don't know where he was when he wrote or where they were when he wrote them. And so there is a lot of mystery. There's a lot of guesswork. There's a lot of speculation in terms of answering these questions. But these are not just simply questions that are designed to sort of stimulate our thinking and give us something to figure out. These are, these are important questions to spend time answering because in the answering of these questions, we're forced to, to really get into the Word. We're forced to dig into the text, to analyze the author's thought flow. What, what is he saying? Why is he saying this? How does he make these moves? What do, what do these things that he says and the way he says them tell us about the author himself? What does this tell us about the people to whom he is writing? So even though we can't say with certainty that, that the author was one individual, we can't say with certainty that, that he was writing to this particular group in this location or that location, we can certainly come up with, with some parameters. So as we start our study of Hebrews, we need to go through and answer some basic questions. Even if we can't really answer them, we can at least discuss what the issues are in the answering of the questions. Who wrote the book? What's the date of the book? When was it written? Uh, to whom did he write? Why did he write? What's the occasion? Because all of this helps us to analyze the overall thought flow of this epistle. And we have to understand the overall uh, book itself, what the author is trying to communicate before we can really understand some of the things that are said within this uh, unique work in the New Testament. Sometimes it's a back and forth issue. You have to do an overall analysis of the book and summary, summation of the book to see what, it's, what you think it's all about at the beginning. And then you go through and you do your detailed exegetical analysis, but then you come back to your big picture and say, okay, does that change what we originally thought this, this uh, book was all about? And maybe it does. Maybe it refines our understanding, and then that helps us in terms of understanding the parts. Remember, our understanding of a part is always related to an understanding of the whole. If you just have one piece of a 5,000-piece jigsaw puzzle, you don't really know too much about that piece. You can't say too much about it. If you have 10 pieces in a 5,000-piece jigsaw puzzle, you can't say a whole lot about those pieces, even if they all fit together, even if they happen to be 10 contiguous pieces that form one uh, little, little area within that jigsaw puzzle. How do you know what's there? I mean, it may just be a, all a blue color or a green color or may look like it's part of a tree. How do you know what that means? You only, the, the part only has meaning in relationship to the whole, but the whole in turn informs the meaning of that individual part. And this idea, this analogy is going, going to be very important as we work our way through the enigma of Hebrews. Now, this book is a book that has a message to believers in our generation just as much as it did in that generation. Because essentially what the author is having to deal with is a group of believers who are tempted because of pressure, adversity in their life, whatever that may be, they are tempted to just chuck their Christianity. Why do we need to continue being faithful to what we've learned about Christianity when if we just get rid of it, life will apparently or superficially go a lot easier? And so they are being tempted to just walk away from their Christian faith. Now, of course, this has generated a number of, uh, a number of questions and problems within the book of Hebrews because you always have one group of people who think that these, uh, these people were, were in danger of losing their salvation. 
And then you have another group of people who want to say that, no, they weren't in danger of losing their salvation. They weren't ever saved to begin with. And the fact that they're tempted to leave or to fall away from uh, cr their Christian walk means they weren't ever saved in the first place. And then you have another group of folks who come along and say, no, they were genuinely saved. And this just points out that believers can screw up just as much as any pack of unbelievers can. And in the process of their uh, going into uh, spiritual reversionism and backsliding, they are in danger of losing rewards, losing the positions, the privileges that God has reserved for them in the millennial kingdom and in the future. And of course, as I roughly go through those three views, you, if you've been around for very long listening to me, then you know that that third view is the one we'll hone in on. The first view is called the Arminian view. And the Arminian theology is named for a uh, late 16th century, early 17th century Dutch reformed theologian by the name of, uh, if it's anglicized, it's James Arminius. Latin version was Jacobus Arminius. And he was originally a staunch Calvinist and then he decided he had a lot of problems with Calvinistic theology, and so he began to move away from that. And one of his students was a man by the name of uh, Derek von Kornherd. And real, the system really ought to be called Kornherdianism, but Kornherd took it a, a bridge too far, we might say, and they ended up with a system of theology that basically put the ultimate reality in the universe in the hands of pure human volition even to the degree that man was, n every individual was not born totally depraved and ultimately he could lose his own, his salvation once he had it. So it really is a threat to the sovereignty of God and the power of God and salvation. And so the Arminian interpretation is that these folks were in danger of losing their salvation and so you can lose your salvation. Of course that preaches for a lot of preachers because they just love to threaten the believer in the pew. Then the other extreme is that Calvinistic lordship view. That's the second view I mentioned. And the Calvinistic lordship view is the idea that once again they, they are being threatened with hellfire and damnation, which means that if they were really saved, they couldn't go through that kind of punishment. Therefore, they must not have been saved in the first place because, of course, a Calvinist believes in eternal security. But if you're going to go through this kind of uh, punishment or loss, you must not have been saved in the first place and of course that also preaches fear preaches that you know if you don't straighten up and fly right then you weren't ever saved to begin with so you better straighten up how do you know you're saved not by the promises of scripture but by your own moral good deeds so that's the problem with lordship salvation we'll have to get into that a lot when you study the whole issue of free grace which is the terminology that's being used today when you just get into this whole debate between free grace and Lordship Salvation, what you discover is the, the three crux books in the New Testament. The three crux books in the New Testament that are debated severely are the book of James, 1 John, and Hebrews. Those are the battleground books. And how you interpret them as a whole depends on, affects how you interpret individual passages inside of those books. And I've gone through James and I've gone through 1 John in the last six or seven years. And if you haven't listened to those, that's out there on the, uh, on the internet to download. But Hebrews is perhaps the most uh, difficult of the three books to deal with and to interpret. What I find is also interesting in a study of these three, these, these three books is that they have one other thing in common. And that is that they're not what I would call true epistles in the same sense of Romans or Colossians or Galatians or even uh, second or third John or, or, uh, or the, the Petrine epistles. And they have certain characteristics that I believe mark them as having been sermons. See, first John doesn't start off with a, with a, with a sentence that from, uh, from John to so-and-so, so, -and -so. so it does, it's not marked off by that salutation, which is typical of an epistle. And I believe that it was uh, probably given at some point as a sermon. See, sermons back then weren't like they are today. 
You, you, somebody got up in the pulpit and just read First John. Most people walk out the back door. They wouldn't have a clue what was going on. And then you read them Hebrews in the evening service, and now you have a congregation of one, maybe. I mean, this, is, this is tough stuff. And James also is, has a, three basic divisions in the book, has a perfect introduction, a perfect conclusion, and I believe it also was a message. But these three books also are dealing with this whole subject of challenging believers in their spiritual life that you may be saved, but how you live your spiritual life today is going to affect what you do in eternity. What you, the way you decide today affects your eternal destiny. And so these are books that deal with, with the, ultimately the issue of rewards and blessings and preparation for our roles and responsibilities as priests uh, and uh, priests and kings to God in the millennial kingdom and in eternity future. So like last summer when we started our series that we never quite finished on crowns and rewards, this is uh, really going to be de developed out in our study of Hebrews as well as in our study in Revelation on Sunday night in Revelation 2 and 3. You get into some real advanced understanding of rewards and blessings and where the Lord is taking us in these, these uh, contingent blessings we have for eternity in, in a study of all these things. So it's going to be a challenge for all of us. Uh, as I study through Hebrews, there are times when I just want to, I get fidgety in my seat and say, why am I teaching this? This is going to be hard on me uh, personally as I have to go through this. So Hebrews is a book to challenge us that we claim to hold on to certain truths. I think that if I were to poll everybody here tonight, we would all say, yes, I believe in the deity of Christ. Yes, I believe in the humanity of Christ. I believe in the hypostatic union. I believe Jesus Christ is our, my great high priest. Okay, well, what does that mean? So what that you believe that Jesus was a man? What are the implications of that? So what that you believe that Jesus is God? What are the implications of that? Now, you merge that in the hypostatic union, that Jesus is, is uh, truly human and fully God, united together in one person, inseparably united, without mixture of attributes, uh, without shading his character from one side to the other, yet it's one person united. What is the significance of that? What's the significance of Jesus Christ being seated at the right hand of God the Father today? Yeah, we believe in the session of Christ. Usually we reduce that to uh, an understanding of his intercessory ministry. Well, as soon as you talk about intercessory ministry, what are, you, what are you talking about? You're talking about that priestly role of Jesus Christ. Why is that important? And what we'll see as we go through Hebrews is as the author builds a point, he then ends that point with a practical exposition or exhortation. And that practical exhortation always includes a warning a dire warning that if you don't pay attention to what this means in your spiritual life, you're going to be a failure spiritually. You will lose rewards and privilege and blessing in the, in the millennial kingdom and in your place with Christ, and you will, you will forfeit these things forever. And each warning, and there are five warnings in the epistle of the Hebrews, if it's an epistle, there are five warnings in this book, and each one gets progressively dire. So by the time we get down to chapter 10, it's just downright sobering to read what the writer of Hebrews is saying about what may happen if we do not continue to advance in our, in our spiritual life. And today there's too many Christians who just think that if that now I'm saved, that's all that matters. And of course there's grace so I can go do whatever I want to do and I don't really have to take this thing about studying the Bible very seriously. As long as I'm saved, that's all that matters, and go to church, get my emotions stimulated on Sunday morning, you know, sing a few songs that I really like singing, and, and just uh, have a lot of warm fuzzies as we walk around and hug each other, and, and, uh, and there's nothing wrong with feeling that sense of warmth and welcomeness in a congregation, but so often that's all there is, and it's, it's supplanted I mean, it supplants the teaching of the Word so that there is no understanding of what this spiritual life is all about. Okay, well, let's get into 
the introductory problems with the book of Hebrews. It's an enigma. And why is it such an enigma? And as I pointed out already, it is because the structure of the book itself is unusual. It doesn't really fit the pattern of an epistle. It has no opening salutation. You don't know who the writer is. It has some elements similar to an epistle at the end, but its structure really doesn't fit that of an epistle. It doesn't identify its author. doesn't identify the recipients. doesn't tell us what the occasion is. Is he answering some questions? What, what generated this whole situation? What happened on the part of these recipients that caused the writer to write this epistle? We don't know. So we have to answer some of these questions. Well, first of all, let's look at the book itself. What is this book? Is it an epistle or what? One of the first things that you should do anytime you tackle a piece of scripture to, to interpret it is to find out what kind of literature you're dealing with. Are you dealing with law or are you dealing with a proverb? You don't interpret a passage in the Mosaic Law, which is part of a contractual agreement, it's a legal statement, in the same way that you would interpret something in the Song of Solomon, which is highly poetic literature. You wouldn't interpret that quite the same way that you would a parable. These are different kinds of literature. You still utilize a literal, historical, grammatical methodology, but because you're dealing with different literature, you handle the statements differently. When you pick up your credit card statement, you read it differently than the way you would read a Shakespearean sonnet. Why? Because you intuitively know from your background in reading that these are different kinds of literature. When you go to a movie, if you know that that movie is going to be a science fiction movie, you're going to interact with it differently from the way you would if it was a romantic comedy or if it was uh, a historical documentary. So literature has different forms and you have to analyze the form initially when you begin to study. Uh, we have to ask the question, is this a letter like Romans or is it a sermon like Deuteronomy? Is it a gospel like Luke or is it a parable like we find in Matthew chapter 13. Just what do we have here? Now if we compare Hebrews 1.1 1, 1 with the opening verses in other Pauline epistles, we'll immediately notice that there's a difference. For example, in Philemon, just to pick something that's just right before Hebrews, Paul says, Paul, a prisoner of Christ, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved friend and fellow laborer, to the beloved Aphia, Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in your house, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Words that for the most part are familiar to us. This is how Paul begins his epistle. It identifies who's the, who the writer is, who the recipients are. There's some form of salutation. We look at Hebrews 1.1 1, 1 and we read, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness, and it goes on to the fourth verse, all one sentence in the original. You notice the difference? There's no salutation. There's no identification of authorship. No identification of readers. So there's something different going on here. So it's obviously not an epistle in the same way that some of these others are epistles. Now some people say that, well, over the course of time the salutation just dropped off. It got lost somehow. Of course, that brings up a number of questions as to what about the sovereignty of God in preserving the Scriptures? It doesn't even look as if something got dropped off. So that's an inadequate solution. The book itself tells us or gives us clues as to what it is. And for this, we go to Hebrews chapter 13, verse 22. Hebrews 13, 22. Writer says, And I appeal to you, brethren, bear with the word of exhortation, for I have written to you in few words. Now, what really has always impressed me about the book of Hebrews is that the writer 
thinks that what he is saying is elementary. Hebrews chapter 6, let's press on beyond these elementary principles related to Christ. Wait a minute. 99.9% of the seminary trained pastors in this country don't understand the book of Hebrews. I'm not even going to go into the pew. And this writer thinks this is just basic stuff? Wait a minute, he's he's just raised the bar a little bit, hasn't he? See, most of us want to think that, oh, you know, let's get some basics here and we're going to get into some advanced stuff and and then we read Hebrews and we realize that the writer of Hebrews says this is just, this is pablum, folks. Let's press on and get out of nursery school. And most of us have difficulty even understanding this book. And here he says, I've written to you in few words, 13 chapters, 800 verses, 800 some odd verses. So it's not just a few words, but it is a profound discourse on the significance of the person of Christ. Now, as we look at this passage, he says, I appeal, and this is the verb parakaleo, which simply means to, from para plus the verb for calling, to call, uh, etymologically it would mean to call alongside, to come alongside, to encourage, uh, to, it, sometimes it's translated to exhort. The uh, noun, one noun form of this is para, parakletos, which is the word for the Holy Spirit as our comforter. Uh, I like to translate that as, as our encourager. He's the one who encourages us in terms of application. But the writer of Hebrews is applying this. I encourage you or I challenge you, brethren. Now the word brethren here is a term that indicates that he's writing to fellow believers. Now we'll deal with the issues related to that as we go through our exegesis. But for now we'll understand that he's not using this term as an ethnic term, one Jew to other Jews. Now it is used that way in some passages in the New Testament, but not in, uh, not in Hebrews and not in epistola- most of the epistolary literature. So it's clear he's writing to believers. And he says, bear with the word of exhortation. And this is the phrase in the Greek, to lagu teis paraklesios. And it is the, the, the word there should be translated message. It's the word lagos, same word that's used to as a title for the Lord Jesus Christ in the first chapter of John. And it can mean a number of different things. And here it has this idea of a message uh, related to exhortation. They're to bear with this. And the word bear with is the Greek verb aneko. And it's a present active imperative. And a present imperative means that this should be a characteristic of your life. It's it's an ongoing standard operating procedure for the Christian life to uh, put up with, to endure, to even to, uh, to, to apply this message of exhortation. Now, when we look at this particular phrase, the word of exhortation, we need to ask the question just exactly what does this mean? Does this have a particular meaning in, uh, that, his, he, he, that his readers would understand? We can't just come along and say, well, exhortation means kind of like preaching, so this is this is preaching. Let me say that good southern Texas accent. This is preaching. We're going to preach the book of Hebrews. No, this is we have to go to the scripture to understand what a word of or a message of exhortation is. One of the things that always frustrated me when I was in seminary was that you, you have this, in our modern culture, you have this artificial distinction made between teaching and preaching. And so often what you discover is preaching has to do with a certain oratorical style. And if you follow this, these style parameters, well, that's preaching. But if you get up and you teach, then that's not preaching. Actually, the Bible doesn't recognize such a distinction. And yes, the message, the word of exhortation, has that idea of a, of a sermon or preaching, but not in the sense that we usually find that in modern churches. To find out what, how this is used, I want you to go to Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13. And in Acts chapter 13, we find 
the Apostle Paul speaking to a speaking to a synagogue in Antioch of Pisidia. And you can just imagine that this is probably pretty much what the Apostle Paul did every time he came to a, to a synagogue. That this was sort of a standard message and you can compare what he says in Acts 14 and Acts 17 and, and all of these have the same basic, basic elements. The, a distinction is that in Acts 14 and Acts, Acts 17 he's addressing a Gentile audience. Now a Gentile audience doesn't have the same frame of reference that a Jewish audience would have. And here he's addressing Jews in the synagogue. This is the same thing that is happening in Hebrews. The writer of Hebrews starts off talking about God spoke. But who's he addressing? He's addressing Jews who already have some sort of content to this word God. He doesn't just jump in and start talking about Jesus right away. He starts with God and he starts with the Creator God. He does that uh, when, when he's talking to Gentiles, he has to back all the way up and start talking about the Creator God and make sure you understand who God is. You, if, you, if you're witnessing to a Buddhist down the street and you start off and jump into the gospel right away and say, well, God loves you, you haven't defined the word G-O-D. And what is that Buddhist hearing when he hears the word G-O-D? He's just thinking about some impersonal force that, that functions out here in the universe. And so when you say you sin, that has no, no, no real cognitive meaning for, for the um, uh, Buddhist. He just thinks somehow that means you violated some sort of uh, social mores, perhaps. So why do you need to be saved? Who is this Jesus? So you, you, get, you have to understand that people are always coming from a, some perspective, and you have to make sure that you are talking about, when you talk about God, that they're understanding who you're talking about. You're not talking about an Islamic Allah. You're not talking about a Buddhist conception of ultimate reality. You're not talking about a Mormon God who is not a Christian God. Uh, you have a distinct view. So Paul starts off here, and he's addressing Jews, so they already have a common ground in who God is. And he says, men of Israel and you who fear God, that would be the Gentile uh, God-fearers who were proselytes or were interested in becoming proselytes. And let me back up, I skipped verse 15. Verse 15, after reading the reading of the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent to them, that's Paul and Barnabas, and said, men and brethren, if you have any word of exhortation from the people, say on. So they're invited to give a message of exhortation. It's the same phrase that you have over in uh, Hebrews 13. So if this is a message of exhortation, let's analyze this message of exhortation to see what its characteristics are. He starts off and he addresses it to the men of Israel and you who fear God. And he says, the God of this people, Israel. So he's starting on the common ground with the God who, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And they understand that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is the God who made the heavens and the earth in six days and all that is in them. And he says, the God of the people of Israel chose our fathers and exalted the people when they dwelt as strangers in the land of Egypt and with an uplifted arm he brought them out of it. Now, who's the subject of this verse? You just read it. Who's the subject? It's God. He does three things. He chose our fathers. He exalted the people. And with an uplifted arm he brought them out of Egypt. So the hero, the ultimate hero in all the Old Testament is always God. It's narrative literature for the most part from Genesis 1 all the way through and who's the hero of every story? The hero isn't the human individual. It's not Abraham, it's not going to be Isaac or Joseph, it's not going to be Moses or, or, or Samuel. The hero in all of those episodes is always God. Because God is the one who is always working behind the scenes as the deliverer. And so Paul goes on, he says, Now for a time of about 40 years he put up with their ways in the wilderness. And when he had destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan, he distributed their land to them by allotment. 
After that, he gave them judges for about 450 years until Samuel the prophet. Now, I want you to notice something. In verse 17, he started with God choosing Abraham in Genesis 12, and he's gone through four verses, and he summarized Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, and 1 Samuel. Isn't that great? See, he's not just jumping into the gospel. He's, he's giving it a context. He says, afterward they asked for a king, so God gave them Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, for 40 years. And when he had removed him, he raised up for them David his king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, and will do all my will. From this man's seed, what's this? This is the Davidic covenant, six verses. He's gone from the Abrahamic covenant to the Davidic covenant. According to the promise, God raised up for Israel a Savior, Jesus, after John had first preached. Whoa, look at that leap. He goes from the Davidic covenant to John the Baptist in one phrase. But see, he's, he's synthesizing the Old Testament to give the gospel message meaning and content. So says, after John had first preached before his coming, the baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel, and as John was finishing his course, he said, Who do you think I am? I am not he, but behold, there comes one after me, the sandals of whose feet I am not worthy to loose. Did you notice two verses on John the Baptist? He takes off with the Abrahamic covenant. In about five verses, he takes you through seven or eight books of the of the Old Testament, ends with the David, Davidic covenant, jumps over the rest of the Old Testament, lands in on the River Jordan with John the Baptist, and then comes to a screeching halt, slows down. We're focusing here on John and what he's doing. Men and brethren, sons of the family of Abraham, and, and, and he stops there talking about this one whose feet John was not worthy to uh, the sandals to tie or to loose. Verse 26, now he addresses the congregation. He says, men and brethren, sons of the family of Abraham and those among you who fear God, to you the message of this salvation has been sent. Now this is a word of encouragement, exhortation. This is the message. What is the message? Number one, he's emphasizing the gospel, but he's emphasizing in this word of exhortation the practical application on the part of the reader, the message from the Scripture. That's the challenge of an exhortation. It is a challenge to apply what's been said in the Scripture, whether it's gospel or whether it has to do with the spiritual life. He goes on in verse 27, For those who dwell in Jerusalem and their rulers, because they did not know him, nor even the voices of the prophets which were read every Sabbath, have fulfilled him in condemning him. And though they found no cause for death in him, they asked Pilate that he should be put to death. Notice how he slows down right to the gospel, but he didn't go there first. And it's not emotional. There's no appeal to come forward. There's no uh, singing of emotional songs to set the context. It is just a content-filled rehearsal of what God has done in history. Now, if God hasn't done these things in history then when he gets to the gospel, it doesn't matter, does it? See, that's what's unique about biblical Christianity. It's grounded in history, and we have to understand that. We can't debate whether or not these things happened the way the Bible says that they happened because they happened the way they happened for a theological purpose that God had in history. So that if you don't have the Exodus, if you don't have the Davidic covenant, if you don't have John the Baptist, then it doesn't matter whatever happens at the cross. The cross is grounded in a series of historical interventions by God in history. And if they didn't happen, then the cross is irrelevant because the meaning of the cross and salvation is grounded in history. And this is where liberalism always attacks the Bible. And if you notice, you watch the shows on the Bible and history in search of, you know, biblical truth, whatever they have on the Discovery Channel and A&E and all these other shows, and they bring in all these scholars. Ultimately, they always challenge the historicity of the Bible, the canonicity of the Bible. That's why this Da Vinci Code thing is so hot, because it challenges the historicity and the canonicity of the Scripture. And if 
it's not really canon, and if it's not historically true, then it gives people a rationale to justify dumping their Christianity. And so this is a point of attack today. So this is why, again, uh, one of the reasons I'm teaching Hebrews is I feel like right now we're fighting a major battle out there. And it has to do with canonicity. It has to do with understanding who Jesus Christ is and what he did. And that's what the book of Hebrews is all about, understanding the superiority of Jesus Christ. Well, Paul goes on, and as he works his way through uh, his, his message, we'll skip down to about verse 38. He says, Therefore, let it be known to you, brethren, that through this man is preached to you the forgiveness of sin. See, from 29 down through 37, he's establishing the credentials of Jesus Christ. It is a doctrinal exposition of the person, the work of the Holy Spirit, with a quote, interestingly enough, from uh, Psalm 2, verse 7, You are my son, today I have begotten you, which is a fascinating verse and a fascinating psalm, and it's quoted in the fifth verse of Hebrews 1. And it's quoted a couple of times in Hebrews. And then in uh, verse 34, there's a quote from Isaiah 55, 3. And then in in verse 35, there's a quote from Psalm uh, 16, 10. But he weaves together these Old Testament principles, and then he brings home a conclusion. Uh, And that conclusion here is a gospel message. of Verse 39, by him, everyone who believes is justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. Now, if you want a clear statement of the gospel from the scripture, that's it. Notice he doesn't say he who repents, he who walks the aisle, he who changes his life, he who lives a good life. He says simply, the one who believes is justified from all things. Now, this is a, this is a message of exhortation. What a message of exhortation is, there, therefore, is a development of a doctrinal principle with the exposition of its application and a challenge to, ap- to application the life of the individual believer. So I like, rather than the word exhortation, which has a lot of religious nuance to it, I like to use the word challenge. It is a challenge from God to each individual to live their life consistently with these doctrines they say they believe. You say you believe in the deity of Christ. You say you believe in the humanity of Christ. You say you believe in the hypostatic union and the high priesthood of Christ. Therefore, do this. That's the challenge of the book of Hebrews. So it is a message of exhortation, a challenge to go forward. Now, the book of Hebrews, is the writer says, he's just written this in a few words, and you need to bear with this. And this is in contrast to what we find today, which is portrayed in 1 Timothy 4, verse 3, where Paul says, for the time will come when they will not endure. And that's that same uh, Greek word there, the word on echo, that they will not endure. That is, they won't put up with or bear with sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers. And itching ears always find scratching teachers. And they will always pay for scratching teachers. I mean, just look at these enormous churches that have sprouted up around the country over the last 15 or 20 years. And they all teach some form of tithing for the most part, and there, many of them are into this whole doctrine of called prosperity theology or the health and wealth gospel. And these, these preachers are preaching heresy. They're telling people that if you give so much that God will return it a hundredfold. So let's all come forward and put your investment here rather than in the stock market or in the bank, and you'll get a hundredfold return. And I have talked to businessmen over the years who have... Uh, put their life savings into one of these churches, thinking that within a few years, if they put $100,000 in, they'll get a million dollars back. And then it doesn't happen, and they're just discouraged and frustrated. But see, this is what happened. Itching ears will pay any amount of money. And you look at so many of these churches, they have incredible wealth, and they pay their pastors incredible amounts of money 
to tell them what they want to hear. You know, the sad irony is we get into doctrinal churches where people want the truth and they're grace-oriented, and somehow the pastor is driving a used car and and, uh, he has to work a second job to make it, and uh, they're just scratching along to make a living. So it's, it's just the irony of, of the whole situation. The time will come when they will not put up with and they will not bear sound doctrine. Now another thing we note in Hebrews is that the writer seems to think that he's not giving so much doctrine. In Hebrews 9.5 he says that there's a lot of things that, that we can't now speak of in detail. And so he wants to say more, but he knows his readers can't handle it right now because they're on the verge of carnality and reversionism. So there's a lot more. And he thought that what he was teaching was just very fundamental, basic, basic theology. So what we've learned from this is that the book of Hebrews is really a, what we would call a sermon. It was originally something that was preached, and maybe it was written down by someone. That was one theory, is that Paul preached it, and someone like Luke or Apollos wrote it down, and then uh, that was sent as a a letter. But uh, that's just one of many theories. Now, when was this, this book written? What's the date? Its form is it's a sermon. It has a sermonic style, even though at the end there's a few things tacked on, such as greetings. Uh, For example, in Hebrews, uh, I think it's 13, uh, 35 or 37, there's a mention of of Timothy. Uh, Excuse me, it's in verse uh, 23. 13, 23, know that our brother Timothy has been set free. So, So the author obviously knew who this group was, knew that they knew Timothy. He knew Timothy. Timothy's still alive. So that gives us some parameters for the date. It's after Timothy has been put in prison. Now, if you read the book of Acts, and you read 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy up to the end of Paul's lifetime, there's no indication that Timothy has been put in prison. Uh, That's, in some sense, an argument from silence, so we can't hang a whole lot on it, but there doesn't seem to be a mention of that. Now, on the other end of the spectrum... In A.D. 95, in A.D. 95, about the same time John's on the Isle of Patmos getting the, uh, getting the revelation, about this, a little bit after he wrote the Gospel of John, there was a pastor in Rome by the name of Clement. So he comes down historically as Clement of Rome. Now there's a couple of Clements, so you have to keep them straight. There's Clement of Rome and there's Clement of Alexandria. And they live about uh, 150 years apart. But Clement of Rome wrote an epistle to the Corinthians in 95 A.D. It's the earliest known non-biblical Christian literature. Let me say that again. It's the earliest known non-biblical or non-canonical Christian literature. 95 A.D. He writes an epistle to the Corinthians, and it's loaded with quotes from Hebrews. Just loaded with them. So he's obviously familiar with Hebrews and treats Hebrews as an authoritative, uh, authoritative book. Clement also quotes from a, a number of other uh, New Testament works as well. It's interesting, he quotes from three of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. He quotes from two or three of the Pauline epistles. So it's obvious that these epistles are already circulating as authoritative works before the end of the first century. They don't have the canon together yet, but the churches are recognizing the internal authority of the Holy Spirit in these works. And this is part of the process of canonicity, which we'll get into as we go through our study. Now, the second thing we note is that this book, it was obviously written by 95. It had to have also been written by 70 A.D. 70 A.D. is when the temple was destroyed. It had to have been written by that time because one of the major arguments that the writer is presenting is that the Levitical system of sacrifices is now outmoded. Well, if the temple had been destroyed, that would be a great argument to use. Temple's destroyed, the priesthood's been uh, evacuated from Israel, therefore sacrifices are no longer necessary. So he never mentions the temple or the destruction of the temple and he treats the sacrifices as if this is still an ongoing reality. So it's before 70 A.D. 
I would also suggest it has to be before 66 A.D. because I, I, I think that, the, that the, the community to which he is writing is probably a community of Christian Jews living in, uh, living in Israel. And since there's not a threat to Jerusalem at this point, they're, they're, they seem to be tempted to go back into Judaism and there's not a threat of the destruction of the temple, which was true any time after 66 A.D. when the Romans invaded and, and had to put down the revolt, that, the first revolt that started in, in uh, 66. It had to have been written prior to that. Now, Paul dies somewhere around uh, 59, 60. So we're going to put 61, 62. So it's probably in this period between roughly 61, 62 A.D. and 65. That's that's the best that we can come up with. So it seems to have been written, though, before uh, there was any threat to the destruction of the temple or Rome's invasion of, of uh, Judea. Now, who's the author? Who's the author? Well, he's not mentioned. We don't know. He is unknown to us. But he is clearly known to his audience. They knew who this was from, and they knew that he had the authority to teach them the word and to uh, challenge them with the scripture. Now, there have been a number of different, uh, different views on who the author was. And it was always a, a kind of a joke around Dallas Seminary finals time when pressure w really mounted. We always heard the story, and I don't know if it was apocryphal or not, about some student back in the early 70s who, who lost it one night, 2 o'clock in the morning. He's been studying Hebrew too long, and, and uh, he calls up Dr. Walvard at 3 in the morning and says, Dr. Walvard, I know who wrote the book of Hebrews. It's, it's certain. Of course, they have to come and carry him away to some institution to, with padded walls. I don't know if that's true or not, but there have been people who have spent a lifetime studying things to see if they could be the one to find out who wrote the book of Hebrews. But nobody knows who wrote the book of Hebrews. And there are, but there are various guesses. First guess, and the one that is accepted by a number of people, is that Paul was really the author. In fact, if you look at the old King James Version, it says Paul's epistle to the Hebrews. That's the introduction. They just assumed that Paul was the author of the, this epistle. However, there are some fundamental problems with a Pauline authorship. First of all, the style and the vocabulary is very different from Paul. Paul wrote in a, in a more common form of Greek, and in some cases, Paul gets very emotional, and he's, he's very fast in his writing, and he uses ellipsis, he drops out words, uses a num number of different figures of speech where he's just, he's moving, he's excited about what he's writing about. And even though in the book of uh, Romans, you have one of the most logical expositions of doctrine. There's still times in Romans when Paul gets so caught up with what he's saying that you, you just feel the passion as he's writing and the excitement uh, that he feels as he's writing uh, the doctrine. You don't have any of that with the writer of Hebrews. He is, uh, this, this man has a very logical mind. He has constructed very tightly reasoned arguments. There's a there's a very tight structure to his, to his thinking, and he just marches you down uh, as he goes through the, uh, his argument and presents his challenges, his five great challenges to his audience. Now, the idea that Paul was the author found, finds its earliest support in a, not the Clement of Rome that I mentioned earlier, but the Clement of Alexandria. Alexandria was in North Egypt, and he taught that that Paul was the writer, and he got this view from his teacher, a man by the name of Pantinus. Pantinus, that's spelled P-A-N-T-A-E-N-U-S, Latin form, who died about A.D. 190. Uh, so that's the earliest attestation of a Pauline authorship. Now, not long after that, you have, have a, another church father by the name of Origen. Origen lived from... 185 to 254, Origen doubted that Paul wrote it, but he still accepted the tradition. He wouldn't go against the tradition that Paul wrote it. Now, that's on the eastern part 
of the, uh, of the Mediterranean in what became known as the Eastern Church accepted Pauline authorship. It was a while before Pauline authorship was accepted in the West, and it was Jerome who translated the Vulgate, the Greek and Hebrew into the Latin uh, Bible. Uh, it was Jerome and uh, Augustine who popularized the view in the West that Paul was the author. Once again, it, it falls apart, and very few, if any, in modern scholarship accept Pauline authorship. Now, another view that has a lot of uh, ancient uh, status is the view that Barnabas, Barnabas, remember Paul's uh, companion on his first missionary journey. Barnabas means son of encouragement, the idea of exhortation again, that same word is used of Barnabas, so there may be some legitimacy there. Now, Barnabas was from Cyprus, and he may have learned a higher form of Greek. See, Paul wrote in a very common form of the Koine, and the writing of Hebrews is the most elegant form of Greek in the New Testament. This is a well-educated, uh, probably uh, perhaps even an aristocrat, who is writing Hebrews, someone perhaps trained and the school of rhetoric, well-trained in rhetoric. So perhaps this was uh, Barnabas. Barnabas was also a Levite, according to Acts 4.36, which means he would be intimately uh, acquainted with all of the ritual of the Levitical priesthood, as the writer of Hebrews is. He's very familiar with all the, the um, uh, aspects of, the, of temple worship and tabernacle worship. Later on, after you get out of the Middle Ages and into the Reformation, Luther put forth the idea that it was Apollos. Apollos. Remember, Apollos was from Alexandria, and he was a trained rhetorician. He was an orator. And so there is some legitimacy there, uh, perhaps. At least it's a valid suggestion. Others have suggested uh, Clement of Rome because he was so familiar with it. Uh, Silas, who was Paul's traveling companion and later was the amanuensis or, or secretary for Peter. Luke, others suggest Luke translated Paul or uh, Luke translated Barnabas. Uh, Philip has even been set forth and then a liberal theologian in the late 19th century by the name of Harnack suggested it was Priscilla that wrote the book of Hebrews. So all kinds of people have all kinds of ideas about who wrote the book of Hebrews. But what we know about this man is that he had a mind that was intensely logical. He had a tremendous grasp of the Old Testament uh, liturgy and Levitical sacrifices. He had a tremendous understanding of the theology presented, the Christology presented in the Levitical sacrifices. And he is able to take uh, from these various sources and weave together very uh, intricate arguments for the superiority of Jesus Christ, for his deity, for his humanity, and to build a fascinating uh, challenge to the church age believer. Well, that's just about as far as we can get this evening. We just covered the, the date, the author, the form. We still have a few things to say about who is addressed, the destination, and the reasons and some things about Hebrews and canonicity, so we'll cover those uh, next time. And then in the third, of, uh, third part of our introduction, what I want to do is, what I've done for uh, the last several years when I've started a book, is to teach the book in its entirety. And that probably won't happen next week, but the next week we'll come in and we'll do the whole book of Hebrews in one night because we need to understand the whole, the total. It's like looking at a jigsaw puzzle and looking at the box top. It gives us an idea of what this is all about. So often we spend so much time getting into the nuts and bolts and looking at all the uh, intricacies of the author's doctrine that we forget where it's going and we lose the, the punch so often. Remember in the early church, when this was first written to this group, somebody stood up and read it one morning. He didn't expound, develop. He just read through the whole thing one morning. It will take about 45 minutes to an hour to read through the whole thing. Most of you would probably go to sleep if I got up here and read it, no matter how dynamic I was as I read it. 
because it's loaded with content. And every, I think there's 88 quotations or allusions to the Old Testament in, in this book. 88. And if you don't know your Old Testament, you're going to get lost in a hurry. I remember when I was in seminary, I had a homiletics professor who used to say, now, men, when you illustrate in a message, never illustrate from the Bible. Oh, well, let's take Hebrews out. Find our razor blade and let's just cut this out of the Bible. See, that's the kind of silliness you get. So you ought to illustrate from the Bible so that people can put everything together. Now, don't just assume people know the Old Testament. We can't do that because most, uh, most folks just aren't that familiar with their Old Testament. So we're going to have to do a lot of... Uh, do a few Old Testament familiarization tours as we go through uh, Hebrews. But we're started, and it's a gr tremendous challenge, and it's going to take tremendous spiritual intestinal fortitude to stick with it when the going gets tough in some of these warning passages. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Father, thank you for this time to uh, look at this remarkable book in the New Testament where you have so clearly expounded the humanity and deity of our Lord and Savior. May we under, come to a greater understanding of who he is and what he's doing, especially his current ministry as our high priest during the time of his session and what that significance is for us in light of our own future role as priests and kings in the millennial kingdom. Father, we pray that we'd be uh, willing to accept this challenge and to put these things into application in our own lives. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.